Today we're here to travel the world with the Abercrombies, who traveled the world for National Geographic as photographers. They have written a book called Traveling the World for National Geographic, and here today is Lynn Abercrombie, whose husband Tom um, forged paths in many, many areas of the world, um, taking photos for National Geographic. And Bruce Abercrombie, who is a videographer, and um, he is immersed in these stories. So um, Lynn, if you would like to start by telling us how you and Tom met and how you got into photography. Well, Carlisle, Tom and I were high school sweethearts. Back in those days, there were no photography schools, so we were self-taught. We took pictures for the yearbook, and um, then we went on to college and did the same. And that was where our career really began because we started taking pictures for the news bureau at the college. And those pictures would be published in the local newspaper, which was a big send off for us. <laughs> so we were married after college and we moved to, to Fargo, North Dakota, where Tom was the photographer of the Fargo Forum. And we were there for. Well, he was there for a year. I was there for nine months, and we were glad to leave. We we have we have some pictures of you all. I don't. This is our wedding, of course. <laughs> Isn't that Palliser. great? Yes. Uh, our friend, the director of uh, the news service at McAllister, thought that would be a great publicity shot. Yes, you all published it. <laughs> that counts. Well, yes. That counts. <laughs> but I mean, at that time. <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, um, <coughs> that's fast, where it all fast began. Forwarding, fast forwarding after 40 years of work? That is after 60 years, I Ooh, think. 60. <laughs> I'm really dating myself. Anyway. Um, the book that you all published to show your work at the National Geographic. Well, it, uh, Tom and I had started the book before he passed away. And he, fortunately, had written all of the text. We were very lucky oh. that we had his words, because he was a wonderful writer. So my daughter discovered all of this, and she is the one who forged ahead. She decided that she had to do this for her father. She oh. was very close to Tom. And. Um, well, she went through thousands she, of pictures and oh, she and worked hard. Years, she, years of work, literally, she uh, did, to put um, it all together. She did a fantastic job. But he had chronicled all this, so she had it there. Yeah, he had he had started it. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and well, she oh, finished it's it. completely different than the book that we originally were going to do. The photographs. <laughs> we just had so many, and and the writing pertained to all of it, so. Well, also, Tom was very modest, and he did not like to do a lot of pictures of himself and that sort of thing. So we had a free hand then to do it the way we wanted. Well, there weren't too many people ahead of you to tell you how to do photography. You were saying that in California, maybe you could have gone to school, but where else would you have learned? Well, uh, we couldn't afford to go to any photography schools, uh, and the photography schools were not really teaching photojournalism, mm -hmm. which is what we were interested in. Well, it was quite a bit later that he got the idea of uh, taking the picture of the robin with the worm, and we took a piece of sod from our yard, and he put a hole in it and put the worm up through it, and the robin took to it immediately. You, but, were, you were holding the worm at the other end. Yeah, right? I was holding the worm. But, but besides the fact that the robin took to the worm immediately, National Geographic took to you all immediately after that picture, didn't they? Yes, more or less. Yeah. Um, it, um, well, it was, it was just a real stroke of luck. Um, because the editor of the Geographic was 
uh, he loved birds, and when he saw that picture, oh. he said, oh, I'd like to have that man on my staff. <laughs> so the next thing we know, we're in, living in Washington. Tom's first trip was to Lebanon as his assignment? Yes, his very first overseas assignment was uh, Le the country of Lebanon. Well, Tom went to the Middle East on many assignments, and <coughs> um, his life was really affected by that. So here we have Tom um, surrounded. Uh, where was this picture taken? And that's in uh, North Yemen. Um, yes, he did stories on every country in the Middle East excepting Libya. Hmm. And he tried to go to Libya, but never could get a visa. in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's Afghanistan. But Yemen is still one of his favorites. Mine, too, as a matter of fact. Yeah, every assignment had different challenges and different Oh, yeah. It was a different approach for everything, so it's hard to say what, what, the, what the rules were on anything, but well, here bring, he is bring plenty of film. That was the main rule. Packing up to go on, an, on one of his trips. I remember one, when we went on the Frankincense Trail assignment, we had 40 suitcases. So did you have um, anybody helping you with those suitcases? No. <laughs> no. Well, porters, at, there were porters at the hotels and at the airport and so forth. Well, the, the extra baggage cost more than the oh, airline yeah. ticket. Oh, the excess baggage was. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about the cameras themselves. They're so different than, uh, than well, we have now. We've got an early one here. That's a well, homemade <laughs> underwater camera. This was made on our kitchen table. <laughs> It's all glued together by Tom and with the, the screws. It, it was uh, made in the, <clears throat> in the mid 50s. So oh, you know so how, heavy. how old it is. And uh, see, there's your viewfinder. And <clears throat> the knobs would turn the film and the settings. He had everything designed. And then. <clears throat> It was supposed to be watertight, but it actually did leak a little bit of water. But it was the only way he could get the underwater pictures that he wanted, because back in those days, there was not a lot of underwater uh, equipment and So he wanted to get the pictures. He built the camera. And now it's the same thing. The camera goes inside the plastic, and you, you seal it up. That's unbelievable. Now, uh, was wonderful? this with Jacques Cousteau? It, it led to that. I think some of these pictures uh, got him a reputation as an underwater photographer, and and that led to almost almost a year on the Calypso. Well, there weren't too many photographers that were interested in underwater photography. So you all kind of brought him to fame, didn't you? Oh no, no, he was he was pretty famous in his own right. But uh, the Geographic picked up on him, and uh, that's what really made him famous, the stories he did for the magazine. And, and that was a year assignment? Well, off and on, yes. Yeah. Uh, but not, not, he was not away for a year, but it was, OK, I have to rush off to some such and such a place, because Gusto will be there, <laughs> that sort of thing. And it was always kind of fun. But what, what's so fascinating, besides the fact that he did that work, was that Cousteau let him do that work. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's more than one or two feathers in a cap. Their book, Traveling the World for National Geographic, has recently been published by the family. And um, Lynn, if you could tell us the story. Now, actually, Bruce, maybe you feel more comfortable telling this story about your mom, um, about uh, when she Which was one? in <laughs> when she was in Saudi Arabia and she had a suitor. Oh well, uh, <laughs> they were uh, in Saudi Arabia together, and they were going towards the empty quarter. They had to explore. It's a, a significant part of the country. Saudi Arabia's of empty Saudi quarter Ar is. It's a desert the size of Texas, mm. and they knew there was a meteorite there. They just didn't know exactly where, so. Uh, on their way into the empty quarter, they they stopped with the, at the last Bedouin camp and and uh, and met the was he a sheikh? Is that how they call mm -hmm. him? Yeah. And he offered uh, 50, forty camels for my mother. <laughs> I think this was before my. I guess I was a lot. I was a little kid at the time. Lynn's, I wasn't Lynn's there. hiding here behind glasses. I wonder uh, why. <laughs> uh, my my father finally decided what 
what could he do with 40 camels? <laughs> so uh, we got my mother back. So you back. got your mom we back. We got my mother back. <laughs> yes. But uh, they continued on into the empty quarter. Uh, they had a guide, Jabbar, who, who, uh, who knew where this meteorite crater was. And uh, luckily they found it at a time when the sand had moved away. Uh, many explorers had been looking for it, but uh, they actually found it. It's, it's kind of amazing because if you're having the size of Texas, how in the world, I mean, you, you all were on some Land Rovers and... Well, our Bedouin guide uh, had not been there before, but some or other it's uncanny. He knew how to get there. He did not make any wrong turns, and he stopped all of a sudden. And Tom said, "This is after two days of driving." You know, why are you stopping? And he said, "It's just over the hill." Oh my gosh! I mean, how did he know? You forged the way also for female photographers or female photojournalists. There weren't any photog female photographers at that time. Um, so I was one of the first, first really. Um, and after that, there were many female photographers. I think most of the geographic now has female photographers. But they realized the female photographer is a better one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could go places men couldn't. Uh in the Middle East, anyhow. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Well, uh, it has its ups and downs, because you, as a woman, you can go a lot of places, but you, as a woman, you can't go unaccompanied. So that presents problems. And Bruce, your dad um, converted to Islam? Yeah, he converted to Islam uh, when I was just a little kid. Went to Saudi Arabia, he did the Hajj. Uh, he took some of the first pictures of Mecca, uh, probably the first color pictures. Um, this one is one of the one of the top 50 pictures. If you get your app on your uh, on your iPhone, you can get the top 50 pictures of National Geographic as a little app. Aww. Tells the story about some of the pictures, and he had it, actually two pictures in that collection. Well, back then they didn't allow a lot of photographs to be taken. Uh, cam cameras were more or less forbidden. Uh, but somehow or other, he got some high-powered people to go with him. So that was how he was able to do much of that. And he also did a movie at the same time of the Yeah, Hodge. I don't know how he did it. He really worked hard. This is in the oh. northern part of uh, Oman, the Mussendom Peninsula. Amazing how many pictures the two of you took over the years, and, and there's hardly any of them that have the same composition or the same. There's no two alike. Well, Lynn, I just find it phenomenal that you're going to these different places. Now, you, nobody could have told you what you were going to find there. Oh, no. <laughs> and you discover things and well, immediately you, start clicking, don't you? You just you know, do the best you can. And, of course, if, if you are to do it again, you'd know exactly how to go about it. But it's trial and error, and you just survive somehow or other. So why am I with you now? Say